Right, I know we've got a, a tight timetable. So I'm Mark Young. I work for Beef and Lamb New Zealand Genetics. As some of you will know that I've done much of my work over the last uh, 15 years in the sheep area. But I think I'm very excited that we've got uh, some strong themes going here in the beef area. And as you'll see from my talk, there's some common themes for sheep and beef in our program and some slight differences to do with uh, where the genetic evaluations are done. So Graham brought up these genetic cornerstones. And what we've said is the program we've got, in terms of the relevance to commercial farmers, it has to be about things that mean something that are directly applicable on farm. And that's about distinguishing the actual performance from genetic merit, something that Kent did quite well just then with that example of, of the DNA technology versus the visual. And we also want to be able to have an ongoing unbiased assessment of genetic merit. So that gives us our information. Once we've got that information, we have to tie that back to farm outcomes. So how can we align breeding values and indexes to farm management goals? And once we've got that, we want to sustain genetic gain so that we're keeping making improvements over time to make the animals better suited to our farming systems and to produce better products. So if we look at it, those each in turn and some of the things we're doing in the Greater Beef and Lamb Genetics Program, so you can see the context of the sheep. Because we have the SILV database and the genetic engine here in New Zealand, it's easy for us to uh, get access to some data and we've had some very encouraging discussions um, in Australia with the people behind Breed Plan about access to the performance data for animals uh, run in New Zealand. They seem to be very willing to help us in that regard and to work on the development of the genetic engine to provide the breeding values that are of relevance to farmers here. We've got um, DNA genotype information incorporated into BVs in the sheep area. There's a work in progress, and Joe's question obviously showing that there's a, a need for that here or, and a desire to have that soon for beef. And one of the things is we have to look at the BVs for traits that are relevant to New Zealand. In the sheep area and the beef area, there are two notable missing things from the current suite of BVs. One's body condition score in cattle, the other one's uh, in sheep or cattle, and the other one is longevity in sheep and cattle. And we're getting strong messages back from both commercial farmers and breeders that of the suite of breeding values we've got to characterise genetic merit on farm, those are two things that are missing. And so we've got adult size breeding values, which creates some controversy, you'll know from um, some of the things in the rural media. But the major criticism against the adult size BV is the lack of a body condition score to make that adjustment for why the animal is the size it is. Is it a big range of the animal with not much condition, or is it the, the weight it is because it's a a more compact size with good condition. So we want to bring those traits in for both sheep and for beef. That's one common area there. When it comes to ongoing and unbiased assessment, we brought in this beef progeny test to get a good feel for how BVs are delivered on farm. And Jason Archer will be talking more about that in conjunction with two of the people um, running two of the progeny test flocks, which is Gofield and Matt Smith, shortly. And in the sheep area, we're going to reconfigure our sheep progeny test to get a be better focus on what we think is needed for sheep genetics in the industry going forward. The genomics is a, a, a work in progress. The one thing I can say now is that beef and lamb genetics is adamant that the one thing all brand breeders and bull breeders should be doing is using DNA to do sire prog uh, paternity proofs. That's getting your sire to sire links right because that is the critical thing in the statistical analysis behind EBVs. And it's also a critical thing in terms of the, your breeding program going forward and giving you confidence that uh, those animals are the ones you think they are in terms of their pedigree background and those BVs before the progeny come in and prove where they really are. So we're going to also use the genomics for increased accuracies and that's the, some work that Steve uh, Miller will be talking about a, a bit later. But as a part of that, we realise that one of the challenges in the uptake of these is the cost of, of, the, of the tests. So Beef and Lamb Genetics will be putting a bit of money into some lab work to see if we can get the costs of tests down, as well as a little bit of, in the gene discovery area, if there are genes that we can use that either are very good genes to have or genes that we don't want to have, and get a test for them to augment those breeding programmes. So we've got genetic information. How are we going to tie that in? 
The themes we see and the messages we're getting back from farmers are about maternal genetics very strongly. This is the breeding cow and the breeding ewe. So I talked about body condition score and I talked about um, adult size. We've also got the fertility traits and a lot of those traits, they're harder to do traits and I think at the moment we do a good job in both sheep and beef with the traits that are manifest early in life and that are easy to measure. The challenge is to get the complete genetic picture for the animals that we want to farm. So the maternal genetics is a strong theme, and as well as that, it's maternal genetics on hill country. So it'll be no surprise when you look at the beef progeny tests, they're on more challenging country because we want to see that performance on hill country, which is where most of the um, sheep and cattle in New Zealand are, are farmed, in particular the maternal animals. In the sheep area with carcass merit, I don't think it's so much of an issue in the beef area, but we've got a challenge to look for the, the genetic breeding objective for the future. We've had a breeding objective for the past 20 years of trying to get animals to grow faster and to have less fat, and some of the breeders are saying to us, we've solved that problem, where do we go now? And so we have to bring in a more comprehensive and better breeding objective for the future, and we're working on that in the sheep area. Some of that relates to carcass conformation and muscularity, something which you can already get through the, um, in some beef BVs with your carcass weight adjusted eye muscle um, dimensions. But it's something in the sheep area we need to do a bit more work on. Once we have got these different sets of traits, it's about economics. And Ken showed with his example of that um, gene max advantage, the importance of tying BVs back to a dollar value. So we're going to be uh, looking at the indexes and how optimised they are for New Zealand farming conditions. And that will be talked about by one of our later speakers. I think Jason's covering that in the following talk. And then we want to look at how we achieve ongoing genetic gain. So how do you know the animals you're buying as a commercial farmer are better than the ones you had before? What tools can we provide for both the breeder supplying you uh, with bulls and you as a buyer that those bulls are delivering what you're looking for? So the key things we want to do in terms of looking at how we present genetic information is make sure it's relevant, accurate and accessible. And the thought at the moment is we've done a very good job historically of producing lots of good genetic information, but you can get a bit daunting to try and pick bulls or rams to buy when there's so much of it. So we have to somehow distill it down uh, in a way not dissimilar to what Kent talked about with the commercial advantage uh, products there. How can we get it right down to what means the best thing for you as a commercial farmer? We welcome any feedback on those sorts of things if you've got ideas about how to keep it simple and relevant. And finally, in terms of achieving ongoing genetic gain, we realise there's a, a need to help industry understand this technology and where it's going, and so we want to offer workshops and extension to give you opportunities to improve your knowledge and understanding so that you can make best use of these things in your breeding programs and on your farm when you're out buying the genetics that are delivering the extra value to your cow herd and your ewe flock. So without um, much ado, I can take a question or two, but we've got the, a time to get through some more talks. Sure. The question was, looking forward in the area of genomics, what types of, of um, tissue samples or blood samples we should we be collecting now so that we have the DNA available to apply to the tools of the future? It's a very good question. I'm going to dispense with that right away by saying that someone else is going to answer it in the genomic <laughs> section. It's, it's, it's my, my field is probably not the best one to answer what is the best type of material to collect for long-term DNA storage, but I'm sure Steve can talk about that, it's on the, specifically in the genomic section. So.